Like everyone come in, get ready to start morning worship. And those who are with us this morning during uh, Sunday school this morning, I know your hearts are lifted. So thankful, Brother Andrew. He did a wonderful job. But he always does a wonderful job. And we're going to continue to pray for him that he continue to have that desire and passion to seek and study God's word as Ezra did, prepare the heart and mind to teach. And he's passionate about it. He loves it. Thank God for him. And what Michelle feeding him? Uh, maybe all the stuff he named this morning, maybe that, that, that was on the stove today. I don't know. <laughs> but he, he had it down. <laughs> <laughs> I love Andrew. <laughs> oh, Lord. <clears throat> but at the time, let's all bow and go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Time of can and gracious Heavenly Father God, we come this morning, been ever so thankful. So thankful for your, your grace and your mercy. We come this morning to give you all praise and glory that is so deserving unto you. And dear Heavenly Father, you're so thankful for your long suffering. So thankful for your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So thankful for the great sacrifice made of us all on Calvary Cross. But offering us his body, sharing his precious, his precious blood. And we know we have to share in the blood. There'll be no remission of sin. Lord, we realize we all have sin and come short of that glory. But then the Father repairs your children. That we put away those things that are contrary to your, to your will. And we pray that we may continue to study your word, that we may learn your word, and do those things that are well pleasing unto you. But you know, he said in your words in John 8 to 29, the last report of that verse, and all the things Jesus did, he did to please his Father. And we know what Paul said, imitate me, or imitate the Christ. And we know you left an example for us all. If we study your word, we will come unto you, although a heavy lady, and we you give a rest unto our soul. Of then, Father, you come tomorrow, and I'm so thankful for this day. So this day that you allow us to assemble ourselves, to come together to exhort one another, to encourage one another. Of then, Father, you're so thankful. We love you. We cannot express our love, but we know that you love us so, that you gave your very best to us. And then, Father, we pray that your children, we give our very best to you. And then, Father, we come this day, but also thank for the church, which is the pillar and ground of truth. We pray that we behave ourselves in a manner, not only among ourselves, but we are in a dark and simple world, that the world may see you through us, and glory, and, and through our life, the thing that we say and do, it will bring glory to you. To you. Of the Father, we come this morning to mind for those who are, who are sick at this hour. Yes, Lord, that you let your word uh, comfort them. You give them the desires, you give them the desires of their heart this morning, Lord. Of the Father, we uh, mind for Brother Johnson, uh, who have been going through a lot over the past year, we realized that he will, he will be having surgery on this Wednesday. But then, Father, ask you, Lord, that you continue to strengthen his weak and frail body. Ask you, Lord, that you continue to be with his lovely wife, his, his daughters. Ask you, Lord, that you, uh, uh, you continue to strengthen them, Lord, that they go through this ordeal with Brother Johnson. And then, Father, Lord, we ask you, Lord, you continue to watch over him. Not only him, but Lord, all those who are sick and shut in at this time. And then, Father, we ask Lord to continue to be our read at, at this time, Lord. And then, Father, we ask Lord to continue to comfort Sister Larry. And recently, she had a uh, death and health family and others. And then, Father, we ask Lord that uh, they continue to hold on to your unchanged hand, Lord. Realize, Lord, that, that you, you shall supply all our needs. And then, Father, we pray, Lord, that as, as your children, as sister and brother-in-law, 
we be, be there to comfort, to edify one another. And then, Father, we ask, Lord, they continue to uh, we continue to pray for our uh, elders, our deacons, our teachers, members, and pray, Lord, we work as uh, not only individuals but collectively as the body of Christ, and we work for the edification of your of your vineyard that we continue to work together. And we continue to seek those who are lost and continue to lift you up. They may draw all men unto you. Now, then the Father, we just come this morning. You have been ever so thankful. We just love you so much, Lord. And then the Father, we ask you, Lord, if you forgive us of our sin, cast in the seed of forgiveness that will not come forth like great rest of the day. And then the Father, we pray as your children, Lord. We continue to be the light of the dark and sinful world. We continue to show love towards you. And then the Father, we pray, we continue to study, continue to exhort one another, continue to apply your word, continue to do those things that are pleasing to you. And we pray we go through the photo of this servant, Lord. Everything we do and say, they will well pleasing and accepted for you. In your darling son's name, we do pray that's it all. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning again. Our first selection on this morning will be two verses of the Glory Land Way. Let us together sing. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the Glory Land Way. Telling the world that Jesus saved today, yes, I'm in the glory land way. You know that I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow is clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Listen to the call, the gospel call today. Yes, get in the glory land way. Wonders come home, oh, hasten to obey, for I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. I'm in the glory land way. Heaven is nearer and the way grow is clearer for I'm in the glory land way. Our next selection will come from page two nine three. Mansion over the hilltop. Mansions over the hilltop. Again, we'll sing two verses of mansions over the hilltop. Let us together sing. I'm satisfied with just the cottage below and a little silver and a little gold. But in that city where the ransom will shine, I want a gold one from that silver line. And I've got a mansion just over the hilltop in that bright land where we'll never grow. And someday yonder we'll never more wander, but walk on streets that are pure as gold. Though often tempted, tormented and tested, and like the prophet, my pillow of stone. And though I find here no permanent dwellings, I know he'll give me a mansion my own. And I've got a mansion just over the hilltop, in that bright land where we'll never go. 
And someday yonder we'll never more wander, but walk on streets that are pure as gold. Amen. Amen. And our third selection will come from page 361 of our selection book. This world is not my home. And after this selection, we will have our speaker, Brother Keith Wisconsin. We'll sing three verses of This World Is Not My Home. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. And if heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. They're all expecting me, and that's one thing I know. My Savior pardoned me, and now I onward go. I know he'll take me through, though I am weak and poor, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. And oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. I have a loving Savior up in glory land. I don't expect to stop until I with him stand. He's waiting now for me in heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. And if heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Good morning. Good for me to be with you. Uh, a few weeks ago, my phone rang, and I pulled out my phone, and I looked, and it said Eric Thornton. And I got a little bit excited because I was hoping he was calling to ask me to fill in for him, and he was. And so I'm happy to be here today and have been looking forward to being here ever since. He and I had the same, uh, we went to school together at Faulkner, had the same teachers, and one of our teachers, Wendell Winkler, used to always say, preach the word and eat the bird. So I was glad to hear about chicken on the menu today. You caught my attention with that. I wanted to share with you, first of all, what I do. I, uh, I work with the Bear Valley Bible Institute, which is based in Denver, Colorado, but I live in Prattville. I bring you greetings from the Prattville congregation. I want to share with you what I'm doing because I think it's good news that you want to hear. Then I'm going to tie it in with the lesson that we're going to be looking at this morning. Bear Valley is a preacher training school in Denver, Colorado. It's been in existence since 1965, uh, but in 1997 began uh, with international locations. And uh, I uh, get to work with that program. I want to share with you there are currently 54 preacher training schools around the world that we are working with. In fact, one of those this morning had a graduation today. I actually got to see some of it live from Ghana as they were having a graduation in one of the schools there. These schools are in 28 countries. About half of those countries are in Africa. Others in Asia, India, Central America, Haiti, Trinidad, uh, all over the world. And uh, we are training preachers in those places. Current enrollment is more than 900. It's pushing 1,000 students 
around the world. Did you know about any of this? It's good news, isn't it? I wanted to share with you. But here's the, here's the best part of it, because this is not just about schools and students. This is about getting people to heaven. And these students, while they are in school, last year baptized over 4,000 souls, which means in the last five years, 2017 through 2021, Bear Valley students, while they are in school, have baptized 17,082 souls. Isn't that good news? I don't hear the amens like I thought I would. Now, now don't let my lack of melanin affect your lack of amenin, okay? All right. You, so you get what I'm saying, right? It's good news. And uh, God's family is growing. When I hear people say the church isn't growing anymore, I know that's an American talking. Because in other parts of the world, it certainly is. And there's a lot of good things to be talking about. Let me, let me share with you that just last year, these students started 89 congregations in different places. 183 campaigns, gospel meetings. 34 restored churches. What I mean by restored churches, well, sometimes it's a church that's just kind of grown dead and cold and they restore it. Sometimes it is a church that is a either denominational or sort of a man-made church and uh, completely restore it to New Testament Christianity. One of our schools in Nigeria a uh, couple of years ago went out on a campaign just for the day and, um, and one of the students met a guy who was a pastor for a local sort of a man-made, homemade church. They began talking and the man was more interested and they began studying, talking more and more. Finally, the man invited this guy to come, our student to come preach in his church. And the last I've heard, they've now baptized 125 in that church. Changed the sign to reflect the, the name of the Lord's church and, and, and see those things are happening around the world. And I, I think you want to know that and I want to share good news with you. Now that leads us into, and we're going to tie into the sermon this morning, and that is how to be joyful no matter what. I get to see a lot of people that you might think would not be joyful because they have less than we have, but who are very joyful. And the question is, can we be joyful no matter what? Now, we know we can be joyful when everything's going our way. You know, have you ever been driving down the road, maybe it's Atlanta Highway somewhere, and you get all the green lights? Every light is green, and you're thinking, boy, this is my lucky day. We, we have no trouble being joyful when we get all the green lights. When my bank account is up and my blood pressure is down, I have joy. But, but what happens when every light is red? What happens when my blood pressure is up and my bank account is down? Can I still have joy then? I invite you to turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 1. That's where we're going to be this morning. Just turn to Philippians 1 and we'll be there together. Because what we find in this book is how to be joyful no matter what. Now, as you are turning there, let me give you a background on the Apostle Paul's four years leading up to writing this book. For four years, Paul had been through very difficult times, one problem after another. For two years, he was in prison in Caesarea Philippi. He wasn't guilty of a crime, but nevertheless, he was in prison. It was a trumped-up charge, but every day for two years, he woke up in jail. Can you imagine the frustration that he would face from that? One day, he finally was released from that prison, but it wasn't for freedom. It was to be sent to Rome, where he would be tried again. But on the way to Rome, there was a great storm. And in fact, the storm was so bad, the, the ship began breaking apart, and they thought they were going to die. By the grace of God, they did not die. Instead, they reached an island. You remember that? You remember what happened next? Paul is helping gather firewood because they're cold, and, and they gather wood, and what happens to him? Serpent bites him on the hand. You know, it's at this point, you ever have one of those days where you, you think, what else can go wrong, but you're afraid to ask because you might find out? Paul had to be thinking the same thing. Prison, shipwreck, snake bite. Well, he didn't die. And when they were finally able to sail again, he went to Rome, where he was immediately placed under house arrest and add salt to the wound, had to pay his own rent. Now, these are the four years leading up to him writing the book of Philippians. And if you know anything about the book of Philippians, it's what, about what? Joy and peace and rejoicing. And my question is, Paul, how can you come out of all of that and write these encouraging words? 
The reason is, he could be joyful no matter what. And you and I can be too, but we don't think we can. Now, if I ask you, can we be joyful no matter what, everybody will say yes because we're supposed to say yes, right? That's the church answer. If you're in church, you're supposed to say yes. But the reality, sometimes on Monday and Thursday, we have trouble living that. So what can we do, what can we know that's going to help us be joyful no matter what? Four things this morning that we're going to see from the text. By the way, Eric said, now, those people love when you preach the word. I said, well, that's good because I don't know what else to preach. So let's dig into the word and see how you and I can both be joyful no matter what. Number one, if you're going to be joyful no matter what, you have to have the right perspective to live from. You know, perspective is simply how we see things. It is how we choose to view something. And when we have the right perspective, then we don't have to lose our joy. And I think the Apostle Paul gives us a great example of that. If you'll look at Philippians 1 and verse 12, Paul says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, now we know some of those circumstances, right? My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Paul is saying actually the things that have happened have turned out for good. They've actually furthered the gospel. He goes on in verse 13, he gives us some insight into what he means by that. Verse 13 he says, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. Now the Praetorian Guard was the elite of the Roman troops. These were the, the troops that were so elite, they guarded the palace of the Caesar. In fact, the Caesar at this time was named Nero. You may have heard that name because he was infamous, infamously hostile and hateful of Christians. In fact, he had Christians killed. These were the same guards that would guard the palace. These were the same guards that would guard Paul. And typically what would happen would be one guard and Paul all day long, and the guards would change shifts every four hours, which would mean that on the average, Paul would be introduced to six different guards every day. Now, I don't know about you, but I will admit that probably if I'm Paul, I resent being there. I resent being under house arrest. I don't want to be in a foreign country. And of all things, I have to pay my own rent, and there's a guard sitting next to me all day long. I don't like that. I've lost my joy over a lot less, haven't you? And I'm not saying he didn't feel that way sometimes. He probably did. But it seems that Paul realized, yes, I have to be here, but so does he. And those guards could hear Paul singing praises to God. And they could hear him praying to God and they could see him writing these words. Have you ever considered that perhaps the first eyes to ever read the book of Philippians were that of a nosy Roman soldier who wondered what he was writing? A Roman soldier probably was the first person to read, rejoice always, and again I say rejoice. Paul recognized, here's an opportunity. It's a problem. It isn't what I would have chosen, but here's a blessing and a possibility in the middle of all of this. And I say that because of what he says in chapter 4, verse 22. Keep your finger at chapter 1 and go over to 422. 422 is at the end of the book. This is where we sometimes just fast forward through and we might miss it, but don't miss 422. He says there to the, the saints in Philippi, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Hmm. I have two questions. Number one, how are there saints in Caesar's household? And number two, how did they send a message to Paul to say hello to the brethren in Philippi? You ever wondered that? I think there's only one logical explanation, and that is Paul had converted some of the soldiers that had to be with him, and they took the gospel into the palace. 
Now, Paul would never have been allowed to go into the palace, ever. Paul could never have gotten the gospel into the palace, but because he had the perspective to look for the blessing in the problem, he was able to convert some of these soldiers who then took the, the, the gospel into the palace where Paul never could have gone. You see, that's why we say if you will have the right perspective to live from, you can keep your joy. Because even when things are difficult, even when there are problems and challenges, and there's always some blessing, always some opportunity, if we will have the spiritual maturity to look for it. I want to tell you about Vincent. Vincent was a student in the Bear Valley School in Wotutu, Cameroon, Cameroon in West Africa. And one day while he was a student there, he was out uh, waiting for public transportation. And while he was waiting there, the police came in and arrested him and every other young man his age. They weren't guilty of anything. They were just in the wrong place at the wrong time. The day before, there had been some young men their age causing problems, and so the police came in and just indiscriminately arrested everybody that age, took, took him away to prison. Word got back to the school. Vincent's been arrested. They began making phone calls and trying to uh, arrange for his release. But he was finally released after three months. Can you imagine three months in this prison? By the way, I've been to this prison. You don't want to spend three hours there. You don't. He spent three months in this prison completely innocent. Now, if you're Vincent, what do you do? I'll tell you what he did. He finally realized, I'm here. What can I do? And he began studying the Bible with his fellow inmates. And before they released him, three months later, he had baptized 18 into Christ and established the Lord's church in that prison that still meets today. In fact, they've probably already met today. They, act, they have their own room in that prison. They even have their own baptistry in the courtyard. The day I preached in that church, there were three baptized. And it gets even better. He was released from prison, graduated school, and went into, guess what? Full-time prison ministry. He now works with five prison congregations and literally through his work hundreds have been baptized and where did it all begin on that one day when that bad thing happened to him that he didn't deserve now what is there in your life what problem situation setting in your life that if you would maintain the right perspective to look for the blessing and the problem, to look for the good and the bad, God could use for good. What is there in your life? That thing that you hate, that thing you despise, that you wish was different, but it's not and it probably won't be, what can you do to find the blessing in that problem? With the right perspective, you see, we can do that and we can keep our joy no matter what. If you're going to be joyful no matter what, you have to have the right perspective to live from. You also need the right priority to live by. That's what Paul tells us in verses 15 through 18. 15, let's read 15 through 17. Paul says, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives. Notice what he says, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What's Paul saying? There are some people trying to make my life more difficult. As if it isn't difficult enough, there are some people trying to make it more difficult. Let me ask you, is there anybody in your life it seems like their purpose on earth is to make your life more difficult. Is there anyone like that? I see a lot of heads nodding. It's like that person's job description is make your life more difficult. Maybe it's a family member, a co-worker, a neighbor. You ever have a neighbor that mows their, their uh, yard at 6 a.m. on Saturday morning? 
Is there someone in your life that makes your life more difficult? And, and how many times have you lost your joy, maybe even for the entire day, because of that person? Paul says, I know what you feel. I know, what you're, I know how it is. But look at what he says in verse 18. What then? Now you and I would say it like this. So what? There are people trying to make my life more difficult. So what? So what? Now, I don't know about you, but I think I do. It's hard for me to say, so what, when they're making my life more difficult. And I want to say, Paul, how can you feel that way? Well, he tells us. Let's continue reading verse 18. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice, yes, and I will rejoice. Do you know what he's saying? He's saying, I have a priority to live by. My priority is that Christ is proclaimed, and if that is happening, I'm going to rejoice. Why does it matter that someone's making my life more difficult? Why why do I even matter in the first place? Because I have a priority to live by. I'm not my priority. And how people treat me is not my priority. I'm not going to lose my joy over that As long as my priority is happening, I'm going to rejoice. That's hard to do. It's easy to amen that on Sunday. It's hard to do that on Monday, right? Now, it won't be long before someone is going to test this in your life. And we're going to have to remember what really matters. You see, that's what we really need is a way to know what really matters and what doesn't. And let's be honest, most of the time when we lose our joy, it isn't over things that really matter. It's over lesser things that don't matter. They aren't really that important, and they certainly aren't a priority. Paul says if you're going to be joyful no matter what, you need to know what's really important. I'm convinced when we lose our priority, we lose our joy. How many people do you know in your life who have no joy and they're always complaining and griping about things that really don't matter. When we lose our priority, we lose our joy. I want to tell you about Robert Don. Robert was a student of mine in, uh, a long time ago now in, uh, in Ghana. And Robert is Liberian, actually. And one day I'd finished class, teaching class, and I was dealing with something with a student, I could see Robert was standing in the back, obviously waiting to speak to me. I finally made my way back to Robert, and he began to tell me his story. You know, everybody has a story. Robert grew up, and he is Liberian. He grew up in Liberia until he was 10 years old. Liberia had a civil war, and it was an awful situation for everybody there. One day, while Robert was in his home village, 10 years old, some soldiers came in. The soldiers killed some of his male relatives. Ten-year-old Robert had to witness those soldiers doing ungodly things to his female relatives. And one of the soldiers even struck Robert in the side of the head with a machete. Still has a scar there. Can you imagine striking a ten-year-old in the head with a machete? Robert said it was hard. He and the relatives that were left, they left Liberia and they went to Ghana to live in a refugee camp. Been to refugee camps too, you don't want to go there. He lived in a refugee camp from the time he was 10 years old until he was grown. And he's telling me all of this and then he says these words. But that's the best thing that ever happened to me. That took me by surprise because How can you tell me that what he saw and what he experienced and and living in a refugee camp, how can that possibly be the best thing that ever happened to him? And he told me, it's because in the refugee camp, that's where I learned about Jesus. He said, all that I had to go through to get me to that refugee camp was the best thing that ever happened because now I know Jesus. He said, I have to go back. I have to go back to Liberia and teach more people. 
about Jesus. He did that. He went back, and after some time, he contacted me about having a preacher training school there. There is now a preacher training school in northern Liberia where he is. He's the director. By the way, that school alone last year baptized 759 souls all across northern Liberia. And how did it all begin? With a 10-year-old boy going to a refugee camp. But he has the spiritual maturity to say that was actually a good thing because the priority in my life was met. Can you do the same thing? If we're going to be joyful no matter what, we have to have a priority to live by. Also, if we're going to be joyful no matter what, we need a power to live on. I think sometimes we think about people like the Apostle Paul and we think they were superheroes. Jumping, you know, leaping tall buildings and flying around. And and no, they were human beings just like you and me. And I know that Paul got tired and discouraged. In fact, it was Paul who said in Galatians 6, 9, don't grow weary in well-doing, which tells us what? You can get tired of doing the right thing, and probably he had as well. And and no doubt he was tired and lonely and discouraged sometimes. And he tells us in verses 19 and 20 that through all of these things, there were two things that kept him going. And you know we need it, don't we? We need power to live on. Life can wear us down. Life can grind us to powder sometimes. And we need something to keep us going. There are two things Paul says kept him going. Look at verse 19. He says, your prayers give me strength. Verse 19, for I know that this shall turn out for my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Paul says, I know that you're praying for me. Now, Paul couldn't see them. In fact, they weren't even in the same proximity. He's in Rome there in Philippi. But he says, I know you're praying for me. And you know, they knew he was praying for them. And he gave him strength. Do we ever take that for granted? I suspect we do. I mean, you think of how many times we do that. Even this morning, we have had prayers, praying for certain people. And we realize that's a blessing, but I don't know that we always realize how profound that blessing is. That one of God's children is taking my name to the throne of God and saying, be with him, bless him. That's big. That's a big thing. Let's not take that for granted. And Paul says, it gives me strength. And how many times have, have Christians grown weak and weary and discouraged and even fallen away and they've not even sought the prayers of their brethren? You see, that's who needs it the most, isn't it? Paul says, I could not do it without your prayers. Secondly, in verse 20, he says, there's another thing that gives gives me strength. Another thing that keeps me going is the hope that I have in Christ. Hope. You cannot cope without hope. Look at what he says in verse 20. According to my earnest expectation and hope. Notice these words. These are are not the words of a defeated man. Earnest, expectation, hope. That I shall not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ shall even now, as always, be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul says, I don't know how it's going to go here. I may live, I may die, I don't know, but the one thing I do know, I will be victorious. And he had that hope. Now what about you? When you are losing your joy, when you are tired and discouraged, when you are sick and tired of being sick and tired, and about ready to give up, do you have those two things? This morning, if you are in Christ, you have your brethren to pray for you and with you, and you have the hope of Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know what there is in your life that you're dealing with, but everybody is. There is a a challenge, there is a hurting heart, there is a problem on every pew. Always has been, always will be. And I don't know what it is for you, but 
But for Paul, he says, I may die, and I'm still going to win. Now, I don't know what you're dealing with, but is it even worse than death? Paul says, even if it's death. If you're in Christ, you have hope. If you're in Christ, you have the prayers of your, of your brethren. We can be joyful no matter what because we have power to live on. One more. Paul says if you're going to be joyful no matter what, you have to have the right purpose to live for. The right purpose. In verse 21, and by the way, verse 21 is one of the best known verses in all the Bible. I remember as a boy for Sunday school, the teacher would require us to memorize a verse. I don't know if you ever had to do that, but you had to, when you came in on Sunday, you had to have a verse memorized. Uh, the first one I chose was John eleven thirty five, 35. Jesus wept. I memorized that one good. And then rejoice. Every, you know, there were a few of them, and then finally you get down to Philippians 1, because it's short, for me to live as Christ dies gain. And we know that verse. And usually we've heard the last part of it talked about, and, and it would be something like this. What amazing faith Paul had to know that even if he died, he gained. And that's right. But don't miss the first part. The first part is more profound than the second. Because he says, for me, for to me, to live, what? Is Christ. Notice he did not say, I am living for Christ. That's noble. That's not what he said. He said, for me to live is Christ. He is my life. He is my purpose. How many times have you been asked the rhetorical question, would you be willing to die for Christ? We like to say yes, but I mean, we don't really know. I had a rough, uh, uh, a, um, a tenuous situation one time in Nigeria. I didn't know how it was going to go. I would like to have said that I would be willing to do that. I, 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 I don't know. I've never ha actually had to make that decision, have you? But here's the, here's the better question. Not are you willing to die for Christ, but are you willing to live for Christ? You see, that's the one that takes commitment. That's the one that you don't make once. That's the, that's the decision you make every single day. Paul says, my purpose is Christ. They were, uh, does that mean I got five minutes? Oh, I thought he was just getting excited to give me a high five. But somebody told me to preach as long as I want. Paul was in a foreign country. He was an old man. They had taken away his privacy. They had taken away his freedom. They had taken away his friends. But there was one thing they couldn't take away, his purpose. His reason for living. Now, what about you? In your own mind, fill in the blank. For me to live is what? Don't, don't give the church answer. Don't, don't say the answer you ought to give, but based on your time and your priorities and your resources, what is your purpose? If we were to ask people around town, what is your purpose? Many of them would, if they were going to be honest, they would say, for me to live is pleasure. If it feels good, do it. I'm, every week I'm looking forward to the weekend. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to do this and I'm going to do these things that are pleasurable. And that becomes their purpose. For others, they would say, for me to live is possessions. I want the newer, the bigger, the nicer. I want to have all that I can get. That's their purpose. For others, they would say, for me to live is power. I want to be the big man. I want to have the title. I want to have the authority. I want to have that prestige. And so they spend every day trying to get that power. But Paul says, among other reasons, the problem with making your life about pleasure and possessions and power is it doesn't last. The pleasure ends and you have to find more. The possessions get old and they wear out or they get stolen or they get out of style and out of date. The power, well, everybody has some, somebody has more power than you no matter who you are. Paul says the best way to spend your life is to invest it in something that outlives it. Staying in Philippians chapter 3, he says in verse 13, Brethren, I do not lay, regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do. There's the purpose. 
One thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the, call, the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That was his purpose, and that's why he could keep his joy no matter what. What about you? This morning, do you have the perspective to seek the good and the bad, to seek the blessing and the opportunity and the problem? Do you have the right priority to live by, or have you lost sight of what's really important? Do you have the power you need to live on, or are you trying to go alone? And do you have the purpose to live for? When we get these things right, then no matter what the world throws at us, we can keep our joy, and we can be joyful no matter what. If this morning you are not yet in Christ, you've never been baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, you need to do that today, and you can do that today. And when you have, you will have all of these blessings, forgiveness of everything in the past and all the blessings in the future to look forward to. Whatever your need is this morning, let us know. Maybe you are trying to go alone, and you've run out of power. Don't do it alone. Look around you. You're surrounded by people who love you and care for you and who will pray with you and pray for you. And whatever your need is this morning, let us know how we can help you right now while we stand and sing. church say amen how to remain joyful no matter what we thank brother Keith for sergeant on this morning for sharing that lesson with us such a beautiful lesson we all go through things every day every single day and we have to remain joyful that way we can share it with somebody else how you got through amen for communion on this morning let us notice the first verse of at the cross and lest indeed my Savior bleed, and did my sovereign die, would he devote that sacred head for such a worm as I at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burdens of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith. I receive my sight, and now I am happy all the day. It is at this time that we as God's children assemble around the table of communion together to remember the great sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who came into this world put on flesh and blood, live sinlessly, so that he can be our uh, way to make it to heaven, to be forever with God. Before he ascended into heaven, he assembled around the table with his disciples, and he instituted the Lord's Supper. In Matthew chapter 26, he took bread, and he gave it to his disciples. He said, this now represents my body. He, let's pray as he did as well. And Father, again, we're so thankful for this opportunity to assemble around this table of communion communion to remember the great sacrifice of your son and our savior. Pray as we partake of this emblem that reverence your son's body on the cross for all of our sins. Pray that we will reflect upon that and that we will examine our hearts at this time. As I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Will you take, take with me now?
He also had the fruit of the vine. He said, this now represents a new covenant. Obviously, the old covenant would be done away with. And he says, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, but I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's pray at this time. And Father, again, we're so indebted to you and for your son, and for his great sacrifice. Uh, thank you for his willingness to come to take our place on that cruel Calvary's cross and that we can have a right relationship with you. We thank you for this fruit of the vine that rubbed your son's blood that was shed for our sins. Understanding without the shedding of blood, we can have no remission of sins. As we partake of this fruit of the vine, pray that we examine our hearts at this time. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take with you now. Also, upon the first day of the week, we are to give back a portion of what God has blessed us with. According to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9, we are to give as we have prospered throughout the previous week. Not only that, we are to give as we have purpose in our heart, not grudgingly, nor out of necessity, because God loves when we give cheerfully. Let's pray at this time. Then, Father, again, we are so indebted to you again for all you continue to bless us with. Not only the spiritual blessings that are only found in Christ, but also the physical blessings that you so richly bestow upon us. We thank you for our different talents and abilities. We thank you for the ability for us to go into our respective jobs and careers to provide for ourselves and also for our families. Pray for the funds that we have collected on this week that we'll give back a portion of what you have blessed us with to understand it all ultimately belongs to you, to upbuild your kingdom, to bring lost souls to you, and to help uh, glorify your kingdom so that the world can see you truly living in us. Pray as we partake uh, and give on this particular day. Pray that you will do so in a way pleasing and acceptable in your eyesight. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I say good morning. Good to see everybody once again on this morning. All right, a few announcements before we move in, a few announcements and visitors before we move into our uh, benediction. <clears throat> All right. Uh, all right, prayer requests for starters. It says, uh, again, prayers for Madison as she heads back to Birmingham uh, next weekend to the start of her second year of college at UAB. So Madison is going to be leaving us uh, once again, but she'll be able to log in and hook in and uh, be with us. So again, I uh, pray for Madison that she has safe travel up the road and that she has a great year as she returns to college to further her education. So please keep uh, the Watkins family in your prayers, Madison in particular, as she travels back up the road. All right. It says, thanking, thanking God and you, my Holt Street family, for your prayers and thoughtfulness in the loss of my cousin. We are thankful for God's grace as we travel to and from Baton Rouge, and we thank and we ask that you'll continue to keep the Nichols and Daniel families in your prayers. I thank you, and this is from Sister Charlotte Carr. Again, keep the Carr family in your prayers as well, and we thank the Lord for allowing them to have safe travel. All right, uh, come to this portion too, where we recognize our visitors. Uh, we have with us this morning, I'm uh, happy to have uh, Keith and Kim and Kyle Kasarjan. All right, had a speaker this morning, our minister. All right, we thank you all from the Prattville Church of Christ. We thank you all for being there here with us on this morning. Uh, we enjoyed the message. Please come back and be with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. Also, um, keep in mind, as was mentioned this morning, our prayer list. We also have our newsletter. If you did not get one, please grab one in the back uh, in reference to our classes. Also, those of our numbers sick and shut in. I think we mentioned Brother Johnson this morning. Uh, having some up and coming surgery. Also, we mentioned Sister Riggins, Sister Powell, Sister Shingles, those that are still on the men from previous surgeries as well. <clears throat> so please keep them in your prayers. Again, good to see everybody out on this morning. Uh, we ask that you'll be back. I want to say, is it 2.30? All right, this is our fifth Sunday, so we will be back this afternoon at 2.30. So please come back, be with us at 2.30 for our evening worship. We will not have um, the four or the five o'clock class or worship at five. We will have 2.30 afternoon service. All right, there'd be nothing else. Again, good to see everybody. Let us together bow. 
Heavenly Father, we come to you once again on this morning, Father, thanking you for all the many blessings that you've bestowed upon us. But most of all, Heavenly Father, as always, we thank you for allowing your son, Jesus, who came to this world and gave his life, that we again may have the right to eternal life. Heavenly Father, we come to you on this morning thanking you for allowing us just another opportunity to be able to come out and worship you in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing us the opportunity to be able to worship you this morning and just being here. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you will continue to allow us to study your word more individually and collectively, that we may grow, Heavenly Father, that we may develop, and that we may work on teaching those that we come in contact with in this dark world to more about you and that they will strive to come to you, Heavenly Father, before it's everlasting and eternally too late. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for all of our visitors. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our lesson on this morning. And we ask, Heavenly Father, that you will continue to be with our minister, our guest minister, Brother Thornton. Also, Heavenly Father is our minister who's traveling and his family at this time. We ask that you'll continue to guide, direct, and protect him, Heavenly Father. Give them safe arrival as they've arrived. We also ask that you'll give them safe departure and return to us if it be your holy and blessed will. We also thank you for the message on this morning, Heavenly Father, from Brother Keith. We ask that you will be with him and his family. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for allowing him to be on the battlefield and the work that he's doing uh, in foreign countries. We ask that you will continue to bless him, his family, and the work that he's doing. Heavenly Father, we come to you at this time also asking that you will help us to reevaluate our lives, Heavenly Father, and to make sure that we're living our lives for you. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this opportunity, and we ask you that you'll give us many more opportunities to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask, Heavenly Father, that you'll forgive us for all of our sins, those things that we committed knowingly and those things that are unknowingly. We ask that you'll blot them, Father, out of the book of remembrance, not hold them against us now, nor in the judgment. Again, Father, as we depart from this place, we ask that we will keep you in our minds and set our affections on those things above and that we will just be those beacons of light and those examples that you would have us to be. Again, Heavenly Father, those mentioned earlier in our prayer requests, we ask, Heavenly Father, that you will grant those uh, members of the body those things that they need we thank you again father for protecting brother and sister uh keith and charlotte carr we also ask heavenly father that you will continue to bless protect and be with madison as she returns to school and we just ask heavenly father that you will be with and bless us all help us to be pleasing and acceptable in your sight in these things we ask in your darling son jesus name 